Hi guys, this is Ableton Bible and in this fourth session we're going to be taking a look at tuning. So we're going to go through a few different techniques of how we can tune a specific instrument or sample to a sound and this might be a reference track, for example we might be doing a remix or it might just be because we've synthesized a sound and we've been given a sound and we're not sure what key it's in so we've got to make sure that it is actually landed on the right note that we're hitting on the keyboard so we can then go to produce bass melodies with it in the right key. So I'm sure many of you recognise this track. This is Battle for Middle U by Julio Bashmore. And all we're doing here is we're putting a spectrum analyzer on this reference track to try and find out what key it is because we can't always rely on checking things like Beatport or SoundCloud or anything like that for the correct key signature information. So some indicators of the key of this track are things like the tuning of the kick drum. So if we use Foxenjo Span, we can set this into the low frequency mode so we can see what's going on with the kick and the low end bass notes. So now we can use these sliders on the bottom and the right to zoom in on the waveform. And it's not immediately obvious what's going on with the kick, but what we can see is that we've got a prominent sine wave. This sine wave can actually be heard in the track, and we've got that coming through at G, and we can also hear it coming through at E as well, as we can see on the spectrum analyzer. And also, we've got some things going down at the low end with E2 and uh, G1. So we can set this a bit slower to see if this helps. There's quite a lot of movement in this bass line, swinging around underneath that beat. So using that technique, we can pinpoint quite a few notes within the bass melody and that are gonna be within the scale of this track. But what we can also do is we can use another technique. And this is where we play notes on the piano or we actually hum along. And for this, we're going to get the operator device and we're going to use a nice pure sine wave so we're not influenced in any way. And it's nice and clear to hear exactly what tone's being played. And we can just play along and see what sounds good. So firstly, to do this, we need to loop a section of the track, such as the chorus or somewhere where we've got a bass melody playing. What we can also do to help us find the scale is we can hum along whilst we're hitting a few notes. And this sounds crazy, but it's amazing how accurate you can be when you're actually humming along to a track and trying to find the key. To me that sounds like my voice and the notes are hitting pretty well on G So what we can now do is we can play some octaves So play the G a bit higher, play it a bit lower And some people just find it a lot easier to tell the pitches apart when they're played higher up So that's why we do this if you need to transpose it, then you can do. So that's definitely working. So now we can just play a chord. That's just a simple triad. And what we're doing here is we're trying to see if it's a major or a minor. So what we have to do is change between the B and the B flat, or the A sharp. So we've got a major chord and a minor chord. And to me, the major is working a lot better. It sounds like it's a happier sort of major track. Finally, now we can just play a scale of G major. See how those notes sound. And you'll notice that we're going to recognize a lot of these notes from when we just went through with the spectrum analyzer. All of those bass line notes are in this scale. So now we've got our G major scale. So that's how we find out the scale of a reference track. So we can start off with notes, then we can play some octaves, we can hum along if we need to, then play some chords to find out if it's major or minor, and then we can play the whole scale and have a little jam and see if it's working. And as well as that, we can support that by using an FFT uh, spectrum analyzer as well. And there's another case where we may need to do it for a sample. So you may have synthesized the sample yourself or been given it and you're not sure what key it's in. And if you load it into a sampler, it may not be corresponding to C3 when you hit C3 on your keyboard. So that's something we need to figure out how to tune. So I've just got rid of our reference track. Um, what I'm going to do is create a new track and we're going to get a kick plugin put in. I'm going to use Sonic Academy's Kick 2 because it's an absolutely amazing plugin just to give us a backbeat. And that kick's sounding pretty healthy to me, so I'm just going to throw down a quick MIDI pattern. So 
So C3 means it's going to be the default pitch. If you ever need to know that with any sort of sample, the sample you recorded it at will be the same if it's at C3. And then we can just swap out this operator for a simpler device. So we can throw a random sample in there. So I'll just drop simpler on there. And then we'll go to samples and we'll go for a conga. We'll just grab one of these. And in the synthesis session, we'll cover more about how we can use this sort of percussion in techno bass loops. So what we need to do now is use the tuner and spectrum analyzer tools to find out what transposition value this needs to be at so that C3 is actually what we're hearing when I press it on the keyboard. So I've just pitched this conga sample down so it sounds a bit more bassy. And at the moment when I'm pressing C on the keyboard, we're actually getting a G halfway to a G sharp. So what we need to do is we need to adjust the transposition parameter so that we're hitting on a C when we press the C on the keyboard. Because otherwise there's no way we can make bass melodies in scale with the rest of our track if it's not tuned properly. So now I'm just going to adjust this transposition parameter whilst hitting C on the keyboard until it corresponds with C on the tuner and on the spectrum analyzer. So there we go, we've now got it hitting on a C. So that was minus seven semitones or plus five, depending on how you want to look at it. It's going to be one octave up. And if we go into our kick plugin, what we can actually do is we can drag the spectrum analyzer from the kick plugin and see what note that's hitting on. Or we can actually just open up the kick two plugin, which is why this plugin is so good because it actually shows you what the pitch is at any particular moment in time. So on the spectrum analyzer, it looks like a G sharp, possibly quite a sharp G. And if we go on the kick plug and we can see it's going from a G sharp to a G for the sustain portion, which is quite a common thing to do with kick drums to move it down either a tone or a semitone for the final sustain portion. So what I'm going to do now is just have a little bash and get down a small bass line. No awards here for creative bass line of the year. But I just want to really quickly show you what we can do with regards to fine tuning the bass line because it's really, really important that the bass line is absolutely spot on. At the end of the day, it's the fundamental driving factor of our track. It's going to underpin everything. It's going to glue the track together. So if it's not completely in key, then why bother? A caveat to that is that if the whole track is slightly out of key, it can actually work because it's all in comparison with each other. But if you've got a absolutely bang on kick drum and your bass is a few cents off, then what you'll find is it's going to give your track a bit of a unnerving sort of tense sound to it and it's going to make the whole thing sound a little bit wonky which isn't what you're after so what you need to do is make sure your samples are perfectly tuned in terms of semitones and sense and that way you're not going to have any sort of cumulative build up of out of tune parts and all these things are going to make it a lot easier to deal with when it comes down to the mix down phase instead of having to go back into the composition phase and make adjustments to notes and make sure things are perfectly in tune so i'm just messing around with the quantization trying to sort out my terrible keyboard skills So we can see we've still got a bit of issues with the tuning of this conga sample. But something we do need to be aware of is that this tuning instrument isn't going to be absolutely spot on. It can operate fast enough to be able to get the pitch of the drum. Because as a conga sample and as most drums, they do have a very heavy decline in pitch in the first 50 to 100 milliseconds of the sample. So that's going to throw the tuning off slightly, but what we can do is try and pitch it by ear as best as we can to see if we can find a slightly more comfortable position for it. Now within Simpler, we can actually adjust the fine tune. So what we've got to do is we've got to freeze and flatten this track into audio. And what that allows us to do is that allows us to detune the clip in sense via the sample panel within the actual clip, as you can see down here. So now we can drop our trusty tuner back on. A lot of people also prefer to use a sine wave from operator like we did earlier. So they've got a nice continuous pitch, which they can compare to when they're adjusting the fine tune. So if you listen carefully, you can hear as we become either too flat or too sharp. So as we push this cent detune value up, when we get to the 40 cent mark, as we push over to 50 cents, it actually changes to a minus. And as you can see, it now says plus one semitone. And what that means is we're now, we've now got a semitone higher, but a flat semitone higher. So all you need to remember is that there's 100 cents per semitone, but 
this detune will flick over to the next semitone when it gets to the 50 cent mark. And the more you adjust this, you'll find there'll just be a position that locks it perfectly into place. And sometimes this does mean you've got to get away from the computer for a bit and come back to it. Because if your ears adjust to the sound, then it can be really hard to tell exactly whereabouts you are scent-wise. And it's quite hard with pitch sounds, but if you're doing this with two sustained sounds, then you'll be able to hear when this is right because the beating effect will go away. And the beating effect is basically like the sound of an LFO, as when it's slightly out of phase, which is what it is when it's out of pitch, then the two frequencies aren't quite going to match up, so there'll be a little bit of cancellation, which is going to cause this beating or this LFO effect. So when that goes away, that's when you've got it bang on pitch. Okay, I thought I'd just quickly make this live set to show you the beating effect in action. So all we've got here is operator on a C3, as you can hear. And I've just set up this audio track as a resampling from the master, and that's not getting sent back out. So this is literally just to show you like an oscilloscope of what's going on with the master. So it's going to show you these two operators combined. And this is just to show you what happens when you may have like two layers of bass. Uh, when they're combined and they're not quite the same pitch, then this is the sort of problem you could have. So at the moment we're just playing two C3s, so when it's the same pitch we don't have a beating effect. We change this up just by one semitone, and remember usually we're talking about scents, but with one semitone this is like a worst case scenario. With one semitone, as you can see this is quite a severe beating effect, and it's basically amplitude modulation, so it's an LFO on the volume. And as you get further away from the pitch, from C3, notice that the beating effect isn't as strong. So the beating effect is most strong when it's about a semitone away. And the further away you get, the constructive and destructive interference of the two waves is less powerful. 